We are, right now, in the middle of an enormous inflation tsunami that has already started and is not going to stop until it engulfs the entire world. Hey guys, Rafi here from The Endgame Investor. Stay tuned, at the end of this video, I have a message for my Patreon subscribers. I will be putting exclusive content up on the Patreon page and I will explain what that exclusive content will be at the end of this video. Today, I wanna to talk about tsunamis. Daniel Oliver of Myrmican Capital, his last letter was entitled, A Tsunami of Inflation. And here, I wanna explain why the analogy of a tsunami is so apt and so accurate. And to explain this, we're gonna go back to the date, December 26th, 2004, I'm gonna show you some footage. Because what happens with the tsunami? First thing that happens is that the tide goes out. The water recedes. It doesn't immediately flood the coast. The tide first goes out and then it gathers in the ocean. And then what happens is that the wave starts to come, but it's not really a wave like a huge surfing wave you see in those cartoons. It's just a tide that relentlessly keeps going and going past the shore and onto the land and it just doesn't stop. And then all of a sudden the sea lifted and it came in. Hey, ready, come on! Come on. And what draws people in is specifically when the tide recedes, they all kind of follow in and then they don't see the wave coming because it's not that obvious. But then when they see it, they start to run. And by then it's too late. The falling prices of 2020 was the receding tide. That's when oil went to negative $35 a barrel. Our top story this morning. U.S. oil prices have become technically worthless as crude futures collapsed below zero U.S. dollars on Monday. That's the first in history as concerns over weak energy demand reached a historic high in light of the coronavirus pandemic. And now the wave is coming and it's not going to stop when it hits the shore. That's why this is an inflation tsunami. That's why we were seeing backwardation everywhere and it's going to get worse. It's not going to stop until the fiat currency system is gone. In my last video, we talked about copper backwardation. What was happening in the copper market last week was that in the London Metal Exchange, copper was being withdrawn by a firm, mostly by a firm named Trafigura, and maybe there were others involved as well, who were trying to get physical copper to end users. And that was draining the stocks at the London Metal Exchange. And therefore, those who were short meaning who were offering to sell spot copper contracts, they either had to deliver copper that didn't exist, which means they would have to buy it somewhere in the market at any price, or they would have to buy their own contracts back to cancel out their positions so they wouldn't have to deliver. So they started to buy back their contracts and they, kept, and they tried to buy them back at any price because the ones who wanted the physical copper didn't want to sell those contracts except at humongous premiums and the backwardation just went vertical, meaning the spread between copper now and copper in three months went to, I think, over $1,100, and that was a record. Now, this looks to be happening in oil. The title of this article is a little bit misleading. It's uh, what we call in Hebrew, the, the main point is absent. What it says here is, want an 11% yield? Give oil a try. What, what do you mean 11% yield? What we mean, what that title means, is that the price of oil now is about 11% higher than the price of oil in a year. An 11% yield means that if the price of oil now is 11% higher than the price of oil out a year from now, then what you can do is you can buy the contract for oil out a year from now. And then when it comes time, when it becomes the spot contract, you can sell it for 11% higher and just wait and take that yield. That would incentivize people to buy the year out futures and then deliver them into the present, which should bring the price of oil out a year from now higher as the demand for that 11% yield rises. And it should bring the spot price lower because those people 
that bought the year at contract are going to sell that when it becomes spot and cancel out their positions and take that premium. And here's oil. This is the futures table. We see oil, let's see, December 21st, forget about the cash price, that's not synced up with the futures. So December 21st, that's the nearest contract. The price, the previous close was 82.50 over here. Now, if we look at December, 2022, this contract down here, we see 72.18. The premium of 82.50 over 72.18 is actually, it's above 11% now. It's about 14.3%. So a futures arbitrager will want to buy December 2022 oil at 72.18, hold it, wait until it gets to spot oil a year from now, and then sell it at around a 14% premium. Obviously, you have to assume that the premium is going to maintain itself a year from now. We can look at other commodities. Take a look at, for example, cotton over here. Also, in backward Asian, December 2021, the price is 106.14. And December 2022 is 89.07, humongous premium. That is an incentive to destock cotton supplies and sell them on the market. And it's an incentive for futures traders to buy cotton in December 2022 and wait for it to become spot and sell it at a premium. Here we have coal, October 2021. The coal contract is 228.50. Now, October 2022, one year out, 124.05. Enormous backwardation. Now, let's go back to this Bloomberg article. Crude backwardation remains relentless, said Keshav Lohia, founder of Oilytics, cute name, noting that the last time spreads were this strong, WTI crude was above $100 a barrel. Either structure is too pricey or flat price is undervalued. Our guess is the latter. Or, Keshav, we're actually in a currency collapse. Hello, Mr. Thompson. I think he's talking to you. Why do I say it's a currency collapse? Because it's not just oil. It's all energy. It's coal. It's natural gas. It's oil. It's cotton. They're all in severe backwardation and they're locked in it. Backwardations are supposed to be temporary to encourage supply to come out now so prices fall, but they're not falling. There's another article, came out October 22nd from MarketWatch. Why oil traders say this key crude delivery point looks basically empty. Remember 4, 20, 20, 20, man, when oil dropped negative $35 a barrel because we ran out of storage space? And that was the tide receding. Well, now the tide is coming back in. It's about to flood the land in a tsunami. Oil supplies at the all-important Cushing, Oklahoma delivery point for the WTI futures contract are basically empty because people are buying as much crude on the front end of the curve as they can get their hands on. This is the exact opposite of what was happening during the depths of the COVID demand crush when WTI oil prices fell below zero in April 2020. That, my friends, was the beginning of a tsunami that has taken about a year and a half to gather and start to threaten the shore. And what is going to happen with higher and higher oil prices? Just like what happened with natural gas, that if say fertilizer companies cannot afford the natural gas prices, they will stop making fertilizer and you will have cascading failures around the economy, lowered production, and the lowered production will bring prices higher as the Fed prints more and more and more money. And this is a stagflationary feedback loop that is all ready here. Here, I want to emphasize one point that Daniel Oliver made in his work on this topic, the inflation tsunami. Inflation tsunami just offshore, says Daniel Oliver. Here he's talking about how money supply has grown faster then prices have been rising. And up to now, that has been true. It's not going to be true for much longer if it still is true at all. This divergence between M2 money growth and inflation, meaning rising prices, is nothing new. Over the past several decades, there have been four major factors that have kept the rate of consumer price increases well below the growth rate of the money supply. First, technological innovation serves to lower costs and prices. 
Second, China introduced millions upon millions of new disciplined workers to the global economy. Third, underpriced investment capital prompted firms to merge and reduce working capital by creating hyper-efficient supply chains. Fourth, the CPI was jiggered to underreport price gains by ignoring decreases in quality. Our malfunctioning financial system has directed technological development to non-productive ends. Instead, and here is a key cultural point he made, he makes, which is why I love him so much. He doesn't just analyze economics as an isolated science. He integrates it with the reality of the world as we live it and as we know it now. Instead of elevating man's physical and mental powers for the purposes of innovation and increased productivity, technological development today focuses on three primary goals, entertainment, pursuit of efficiency, and financial speculation. Mass entertainment requires lowest common denominator content. I'm sure we can all identify with that. Sapping the moral fiber of the country. Radical efficiency comes at the cost of flexibility and resilience and introduces horrors such as the Amazon warehouse and mass surveillance and fast food robot chefs. Mass conformity for which communist countries are rightly mocked becomes ubiquitous. Financial speculation misallocates capital into various Ponzi schemes where it is sooner or later destroyed. Now here's the, here's the key paragraph. If primary input costs are increasing 50% or 100% or more, if labor costs are soaring, if just-in-time inventory management is broken, if distribution networks are snarled, if shortages persist, large companies will sooner or later have no choice but to break and reset prices suddenly higher, much higher, just to cover their costs. And then all of a sudden the sea lifted and it came in. Hey, ready, come on! Then they will raise prices further to anticipate future cost increases. CPI inflation, rising prices he means, will suddenly start rising faster than money supply growth, just as in the 1970s. So I have a question for all of you. Do you feel your mentality starting to shift from I need to put away more money to I need to buy more stuff before the prices rise? I've been feeling it. I just made a big purchase at a supermarket, one of the biggest we've ever made, and put stuff away. That mentality is shifting. And we've seen it in a recent tweet by Jack Dorsey, CEO of Twitter, who tweeted explicitly that hyperinflation is on the way and that it will change everything. Now, one last thing, what protects you from this, and I'm not going to just say it conceptually, I'm going to show you graphically. This chart shows you how many barrels of oil one ounce of gold can buy you. Back in 2008, one ounce of gold could buy you about six and a half barrels of oil. You can see that here, June 1998, around the oil peak of that time. From six and a half barrels now to 21. 0.5 barrels, one ounce of gold can buy you. So is oil getting more expensive or is it getting cheaper? Now, obviously, at the time when oil was negative $35 a barrel, back in April 2020, gold could buy you a lot more barrels of oil than it can now. That's true. There are always corrections within an ongoing bull market for gold, but it's not really a gold bull market. This is an ongoing dollar bear market where dollars can buy you less and less and fewer, fewer barrels of oil or real energy, real commodities. If you price any commodity in terms of gold over the past 20 years, you will see that gold can buy you more and more and more stuff and dollars can buy you less and less. So how do you protect yourself against an inflation tsunami? Gold is not an inflation hedge. It can function as an inflation hedge, but what it is, gold is simply money that is not inflated. That's what makes it an inflation hedge because when the money substitute dies, the only thing left is real money and that is gold. And whatever supplies are left on this planet and whatever capital is left to produce them will be traded for very, very small amounts of gold because the desperation for a functioning monetary medium will be so great that the purchasing power of those who hold the physical material will be so large that the resulting transfer of wealth will be 
enormous. The question is what side of that wealth transfer do you want to be on? This is Rafi of The Endgame Investor. Please support me by either signing up for a two-week free trial of The Endgame Investor, link in the description below, or you can sign up at my Patreon page where I'll be putting exclusive content. For now, I will start with the weekly research I'm doing into my libertarian commentary on the Pentateuch, on the five books of Moses, Torah portion by Torah portion, the notes I make and the research I'm doing. You'll see how the commentary is progressing. I basically gather all relevant economic and liberty sources on the weekly Torah portion from medieval commentators, gather them into a hopefully magnum opus that I'm putting together to speak to the future generations of this planet and help them understand what's going on now and where they are, wherever they are, whenever they are. It's important not just to speak to this generation of people, people that are alive now, but people that are alive in the future. When you read books, you are speaking to the past. When you write books, you are speaking to the future. You have to keep the line of humanity, of saneness, of sanity alive by speaking with the past and writing to the future. And that's what keeps humanity intact. I think he's talking to you. This is Rafi of the Endgame Investor. I will see you soon.